Hi, my name is Jeremy Shines, and this is I Am Loved Church. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for another day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your truth and your life. Father, I pray that you would open up our hearts. You would open up our minds. You would open up our spirits and our soul. We give this day and this hour to you to hear from you. Speak to us. Speak through me. Let it be your word that is edified. Let it be your son that is glorified. Not me, not anything that I do, but you. I can't thank you enough for what you've done and will do. We praise you. We love you. We want you. And we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Today, we're going to be talking about father. The Greek word for father comes from the Latin word pater, which could also mean dad, daddy, pop, papa, pa. Other meanings in Greek are a society of people reflecting the same spirit as their father. It is one who has infused his own spirit into others and influences or governs their minds. It's a title of honor. A teacher who trains their pupils, children, students, or followers to obey their teachings and guidance in order to take charge of the interest of others. The Hebrew word for father is ab. It's interesting because they're the first two letters of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, Bet. It's where we get our English word, alphabet. And the Hebrew meaning of Ab is a father, or it could also mean a house, home, the head or founder of a household, the head or founder of a group the head or founder of a family, the head or founder of a clan ancestor, a producer or creator of some kind. Father is a term for respect or to be a ruler or chief of others or people. The image of what a father really represents in our sermon today is a teacher or the headship of a household or a leader or the headship of a church or the headship of a society or the headship of a community or the headship of a town or the headship of a city or the headship of a government or the headship of a nation. These all represent what a father could be. If the head of the house is cruel, or leader or father of that house is cruel, childish, a jokester, selfish, unforgiving, angry, bitter, lazy, unteachable, in other words, evil, the rest of that house will reflect his example. However, if the head of the house is kind, gentle, loving, patient, self-sacrificing, honest, forgiving, and so on, the rest of that house will directly imitate his example. Whoever the head or father of a house is, the people or children, followers, students, or disciples will also imitate his example. Today, we're going to be looking at John chapter 8. Not the whole thing, just the middle section of it. 
It starts off at verse 31. And earlier in John chapter 8, Jesus got up from spending most of his time in the Mountain of Olives. He would teach his disciples there. It was located a mile away from the Jewish temple, which was more likely Herod's temple at the time. And so it said he got up at dawn. It's pretty early, at 5.20 a.m. in the morning. Jesus appeared in the temple courtyard. There were two halves of this temple. One half was welcomed by the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin. It was basically people who were considered to be holy or perfect or clean. And everyone else was allowed on the other half of the temple. And they were considered to be unclean. Why would someone wake up at 5.20 in the morning to go to the temple? Well, we don't really know what day it was, but I'm thinking it was probably the day of sacrifice or a holiday. And, but regardless of the point, this temple courtyard, it was like a city market. And it was like everybody would, would go there. And they would go there to worship God in the morning to offer up their sacrifices, which is kind of very interesting because they saw Jesus teaching the people who were uneducated, who were all from different backgrounds, who were even Gentiles, non-Jewish people. And these Pharisees were constantly trying to challenge Jesus, and they were very skilled at knowing the law. They knew God's law, but they didn't know who they were talking to. And so they're offering up animal sacrifices that morning, worshiping God, and they threw Mary Magdalene, or what we suppose to be Mary Magdalene, I, I believe it actually is because of the other Gospels and what they say, at Jesus' feet, offering her up as a sacrifice. And it's interesting, as Jesus says, one of the most amazing lines in Scripture, he who is without sin cast a first stone. And a lot of them left, and some of them continued to challenge him. So in this marketplace, there were all kinds of people, tax collectors, people, where people paid taxes as well, people shopped. It was probably very loud. I don't know about the morning, but it was very early. And merchants, and there were Gentiles, and there were women, paralytics, and animals being sold, animals being butchered, animals being sacrificed. The outer courtyard probably smelled pretty badly. And like I said, half of the courtyard was only reserved for those who were clean, and the other half for those who were not clean. You know, they thought they had special privileges with God. And here we have a teacher of God teaching the people who were not allowed on the other side to get taught in the temples, in the main temples. And this is interesting because these teachers of the law, they drew the people to themselves. They loved to be sitting on high seats and whatnot and to be called teacher and master. However, here comes Jesus. He's dressed like a common man. And he's teaching people, and they're all gravitating towards them in the marketplace. So I'm sure they were pretty upset. They thought they were masters. And they come to find out, here's this common dude teaching people. So let's get right to it, all right? They thought they were without sin, but they found out there was probably there was someone else who was there without sin. And we're going right into chapter 8. In John chapter 8, 31 through 47, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So what do we see here? We're seeing the Jews, 
But some of them who did believe in Jesus, Jesus was calling them out and saying, I'm speaking to the Jews who do believe me. And he said, if you hold to his teachings, then you will really be his disciples. Jesus is looking to make disciples. And he says, those disciples who hold on to his teachings will know the truth, and the truth will set them free. What is he really talking about here? Whoever holds to Jesus' teachings will know the truth. Disciples are also called, or can be called, followers or pupils or students or believers in this case. Jesus speaks to those who place their faith in him. In order to be taught, we have to place our faith in our teachers in order to believe or become followers. Jesus is asking us to be followers or pupils or students and to place our faith in him and what he's telling us, who he is and what he knows. If a if is a condition or stipulation on our behalf, it's a choice. He says, if you hold to my teachings, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And hold as a verb means action. It's not something we just hear and listen to. It means we, we believe it enough to act upon what we believe. And when we hold to his teachings, we are truly his disciples. When we act upon what he has taught us, we are truly his students, truly his pupils, truly his followers, truly his believers, truly his disciples. Jesus is commanding us to hold on to his teachings. It's a commandment. We need to look for the verbs and what passages or verses of scripture are pointing us to action to do. And my question is to you guys, do you believe it enough to act upon this word? Do you believe it enough to put his words into action? And he says, if you do that, then you are my disciples. Do you just read the Bible? Reading the Bible is very important. Do you have enough faith to read the Bible, to open it up and to read it on a regular basis? And what it means to be a pupil or student or follower of Jesus, it really means to be a student of his word, to be a student of his teachings. Are we students of his teachings? Will you consider yourself to be a student of what Jesus is teaching? And do you hold on to it? Or is it just a hobby? Or is it just something that you're just bored that day and you read the Bible? A student is actively in pursuit of what the teach of understanding what the teacher is telling. And in this case, putting in action of what they've been taught. I guess the question I would ask is do you know that the truth which is written in here can set you free? And do you know or do you want to be free? John 8.33, they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? They are claiming that they're Abraham's descendants. They are quick to let Jesus know their thoughts. They're firing back at him. They claim to know who they are. They're like, we're Abraham's descendants. We know who we are. They do not believe they are slaves to anyone. So they're completely on that side. They are ignorant of their condition of what Jesus is talking about. They are challenging Jesus and everything he's teaching. These people are looking for an argument so they can be right. They hate being wrong and hearing what someone else has to say contradicts their teachings or what they've been taught. So, 
Jesus is teaching us about sin in this case. And they're rejecting what he's teaching and basically saying they don't have no sin. They don't care about what Jesus had to say. They just wanted to respond back. They think they have faith like Abraham. Abraham had faith. He believed in God. He believed in Jesus. Which is very interesting. And, and Jesus is saying, you don't have faith like Abraham. Because Abraham was a good student of mine. A good follower of mine. He believed in me. They're placing their faith in themselves. When you actually listen to the conversation, you actually hear, why are they not receptive to what he's saying? They're not placing their faith in Jesus. They think... They know more than Jesus. In other words, they think they know more than their teachers. And just because we believe something does not make it true. In other words, just because we believe we want something to be true doesn't make it true. In this case, they were believing that they were children of Abraham. They are fully convinced they're telling the truth. Now, are we without sin? Absolutely not. Do we care what Jesus has to say? Hopefully, right? Or are we gunslingers with our words, challenging our teachers or teachers God has put in our path to guide us? Or do we place our faith in ourselves, or do we place our faith in the Lord? If the Lord has provided teachers for us, I think because it comes from the Lord, we should definitely place our faith in our teachers. They may not be 100% accurate like Jesus, but God has put them there for a reason. Do we act like we know more than who our teachers, whether it's a pastor or whether it's someone that we're being taught from? I don't know about you, but if you've ever taught at an elementary school or taught kids, there are some kids that think they actually know more than you. And it's kind of really annoying. <laughs> it's not fun at all. And in this case, this is what's happening. We have a great teacher, Jesus. And these people will not let Jesus teach them. Because they were fully convinced that they were right. They were even fully convinced that they had more authority than Jesus. But they have fully convinced themselves into a lie. Do you do that? Are you fully convinced about something that may end up actually being a lie? And how do you know that for sure? You see, and that's why we have to hold to the word of God and stop putting our own interpretation into the word of God and start drawing out what the word of God says. We have to dig deep into who God is. You see, God's identity in his mind, in his heart, they're in here. They are. But so much times we only want to take one verse in the Bible and a verse over here and a verse over there. And we want to combine them and we want to make them say what we want them to say. We take them out of context. And sometimes it is what God is thinking sometimes but that's very sketchy some people have even taken so much out of context where it is not even a biblical teaching it's not even what God thinks at all and that's happening a lot and I like to apologize for a second and ask for forgiveness from you guys and from the Lord and say I've been doing that a lot of things that I taught were probably what God said. But just because I believed it doesn't make it true. And the Lord has finally taught me how to teach his word. And I thank him for that. I want you guys to hear from your Lord and your master and your teacher and your father. Not from me or my opinion or my emotion or what's going on in the world 
or get to draw attention to myself because that's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to tell you the truth. And I believe that's what Jesus was doing in this moment. Do you have a problem with always trying to be right? Like, do you actually shut up and listen to what's being said and to discern what's being said and to marinate on what's being said? I'm going to listen. Is it the Holy Spirit talking to me? Or is it just my opinion? Or are my opinions always trying to fight the truth on what's being said or spoken by someone who's speaking truth? Let's go to John 8, 43 through 38. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me, because you have no room for my word. I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence. And you are doing what you have heard from your Father. These people were very, very stubborn. That's what I get. They thought they knew everything. Very, when Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, means ex extremely important. Everyone, meaning anyone, not just the Jews in this case, anyone who sins is a slave to sin. Slaves do not belong to families, nor do they have the privileges of being a member of the family. They are slaves. Relatives belong to a family. Members of a household belong to a family. And they have family privileges. The son sets people free from sin. And sin makes us its slave. The son in this case is Jesus. He sets people free from their sin. So they can become part of a family. Jesus knows that they are Abraham's descendants. Yet, he also knows they are trying to kill him. They do not accept his teachings. Jesus has been in God's presence. Jesus sees what God sees. Jesus says, he knows who they really are. Even though they're claiming to know who they are. Jesus is like, I actually know the truth about you. They do not want to hear from Jesus. But they have done what they heard from their father. They don't want to make room for what Jesus has to say or his word. Because they've already made up their minds. So it's interesting in this case, what I see is Jesus already knows everything. I mean, he's claiming that he's been in God's presence. He claims that he knows and sees what God knows and sees. So that just blows me away. And so everything that he's saying, he's speaking directly to their sin in this case. And he's saying, I know what you're thinking. And I know who you are. I know your heart. I know where you've been. I know where you came and I know where you're going. So in this case, what I'm what I'm really seeing is as a reversal from earlier in the chapter from Mary Magdalene when they try to stone her. So they're trying to call her sin out, and now Jesus is trying to not trying, Jesus is calling their sin out. They keep rejecting the truth. Every time someone comes to them. In this case, Jesus keeps coming to them and he keeps calling them out on their sin. You know? 
think about that for a second. And they keep denying it. They keep denying and denying. Like, no, I ain't got no sin. I'm good. <sighs> so much that they start hating him and they want to kill him. And they think what he's teaching is, is bad or even considered to be evil. They don't even want to listen to what he has to say. They don't want to consider what he's even saying. Jesus is calling them to repent because in this moment, he's exposing everything that they're thinking. He's exposing their heart. He's exposing their mind. He's exposing their lives and their sin and behavior. They're trying to fit Abraham and Jesus into their own narratives. They cannot accept the truth about the reality of their condition or the truth and reality of who Jesus is, the truth or who ra reality of who Abraham really was. Instead, they're trying to reason with Jesus and trying to justify their sin. In other words, they're trying to hide their sin with their justification and their reasons. How many people know people who always justify their bad behavior? How many people have been someone that has justified their bad behavior instead of repent of their sins and turn from their sins and run away from their sins? Don't do it again. Change your behavior. Most people don't want to change their sin. They don't want to leave their life of sin. They don't want to leave their bad behavior. They don't want to change. They don't want to be forgiven for their sins. They think they have to pay for their own sins. They don't think what Jesus did was enough. They don't believe it. They're trying to find another way outside of what Jesus has taught, outside of who Jesus is, to redeem their sin. Jesus already paid for that sin. And it's our job to believe it, receive the healing. And it's our job if we do it, it's a condition, it's a stipulation on our behalf. Jesus already did his part. Jesus has already taught us. Jesus has already resurrected. Jesus has already ascended to the right hand of the Father. Now it's on our behalf if we believe it enough to apply it. And Jesus says, you're forgiven, you're forgiven. When Jesus said, you're made new, you're made new. When Jesus says, I love you, he means, I love you. Jesus always tells the truth about who he is and what he thinks about you and what he knows about you. And if Jesus is calling you to repent of your sins, I'll repent my sins. I don't like it. Sometimes I just really think I was right. But Jesus is saying, Jeremy, what's more important, being right or being healed? Dang. Being right or being healed? I want healed, man. I don't want pride. You see, a lot of people in this world can't accept correction. And my question is to you, can you accept correction? If you can't accept correction by normal people in this world, how could you accept correction from God who works in through normal average people? Do you have room for God's lot, word in your life? Or is it on the back burner of every day? Do you wake up every day looking to read God's word, looking to spend time with him, looking to pray to him, looking to give him attention and think about him? Or is he on the back of your mind because you've got all these other things that you want to do in your life? Or more important, right? That's called idolatry. If God is not the head of your house, if he's not the head of of your thoughts. The first thing you do when you wake up in the morning, Lord, you are my father, means you are my head. You are the head of my house. Your teachings, your way, your will, right here. This goes before everything. Not my favorite radio station, not my favorite TV show, not my favorite other books. Your word becomes the head of my house, your teachings, because a father teaches his children. Are you trying to fit people and ideas and beliefs and other narratives into God's word, into his truth? 
they don't fit. I'm gonna tell you that right now. They don't fit. <laughs> and I, and I, and I'm gonna say this. There's a lot of people trying to put, like I said before, trying to put their own interpretation of this. Now I want you. Now I want you to think for a second. This is an example. I'm gonna grab something from around me. This is a little toy from my one of my daughters. They're trying to put this. Whether they're, let's just say this is their emotion. Let's just say this is their past experience. Let's just say this is their dream. I had a dream, or this is my opinion, or this is what I believe, or this is how I feel. You know, and they're trying to put this into this and say, no, this is in here. This is in here. Look, look, if you just put this here and grab this Bible verse and put this Bible verse over here, put this Bible verse and put this and move this word over here. See, you will see that God wants me to worship this. You would see that God likes this in my life. And this represents sin, for example. See, if you just having a good imagination, you will believe what I'm saying is true. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't use my imagination over what God is saying. I'm not using my experience over what God is saying. I'm not using my dreams over what God has already said. You see, this is enough. And anything that contradicts this, whether it's my past, my dreams, my emotions, my opinion, what's going on in this world, what other people say, does not matter. This is the only thing that has the first and final word over what God says. And my job here, our job as Christians, is to dig in here and stop digging outside here, trying to put everything out here, inside here. Our job is to dig inside the word and find out what God says about it and stop moving verses around. <clears throat>
their preconceived notion about who Abraham is and their preconceived notion about who Jesus is. But Jesus denied everything that they said. They said, you're lying. You don't know anything about Abraham. I know Abraham. You don't know anything about me. I know me. You don't know anything about God. I know God. They do not know what they're talking about. And listen here. But they protested that they knew something. I mean, think about this person right here. Someone who, this is great evidence to show you, when people don't know what they're talking about, they will get loud and they will protest, usually. Not in all cases, but they will protest. I mean, think about what's going on in the world right now. They don't want to be wrong, so they want to protest. I'm not getting into that right now. <laughs> Jesus, in this case, is not seeking attention for themselves. But these people here, who claim to be Abraham's children, are seeking attention for themselves. That's it. That's their intention. They want to be glorified. They want the attention for themselves. They don't want the truth. And they don't behave like Abraham behaved. Abraham did not want to kill Jesus. They want to kill Jesus because Jesus is a man who tells them the truth. And people of this age or people in sin don't want to know the truth. So they want to kill everyone who tells the truth. It's not just Jesus. It's for the Christians who actually are telling the truth. There's this, I guess, documentary or movie where it's called the American Gospel. And it's basically, if you see it, or see the trailer, it's like two, three minutes, it talks about the gospel of prosperity and whatever, and the, the, the real gospel of persecution. There's two gospels in this world being preached. There's this gospel of, oh, everything's going to be okay, and da, 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 and it is. But... To go, you need to get rich, and if you're not rich, and if you're suffering with sin and all that stuff, then you're, God, you're not doing what God wants you to do. And then there's this other gospel where everyone in the world, in the third world countries, for getting persecuted, being killed, being martyred for their faith, being tortured for their faith. And when we look at the Bible, those who are actually preaching the real gospel are being hated, are being persecuted for their faith. But those who are being you know, TV movie stars of their faith. I don't think they're for God, to be honest. Because those who are telling the truth, like Jesus here in this case, these people want to kill him. Think about everything that's going on in the world right now. People who are exposing, let's just say Hollywood, right? People are exposing these government people, right? They've painted red targets on these people's backs because they're exposing them they're telling them the truth about their actions and they don't have any room for the truth so they want to kill them they're like i don't want to be found out and so these people hate the truth they hate god's word and they hate jesus and they hate god but yet in this case they're claiming that they're abraham's children they want to kill him because he tells the truth how many people I want to kill you because you tell or hurt you or hate you or persecute you because you tell the truth about God's word. Those are those people who are children of Satan. Long story short, Jesus claims to know what Abraham was like. Jesus says they are acting like their father. They're not acting like Abraham. They're not acting like God. They're not acting like him. They're acting like children of their father. And we're going to find out who that is. They deny that they're illegitimate children. We're not illegitimate. We belong. Right? They are protesting against everything that Jesus is saying. I mean, dang. And they think that Abraham is their father. And here's my thing. Just because we are born from a specific bloodline or heritage or ancestors or parents does not necessarily mean we will be like them. None of their actions resembled Abraham's actions. They hated not knowing something. 
So they would just most of the times make it up just so they can be right, even if it was a lie. They just loved the spotlight, and they saw Jesus getting more attention than they were. We are not who we come from, but we are who we are taught by. We are not who we come from, we are who we are taught by, who we allow to feed our minds. That's who we truly will become in the end. And to be illegitimate would also mean to be unlawful, or to be a criminal, or to be corrupt, or to be dishonorable, in this case, children. And that's what Jesus is saying. Well, they kind of came to that conclusion of what Jesus was saying. <laughs> we are not illegitimate children. But Jesus is saying your actions are showing differently. To be a criminal would also mean to have broken some sort of law or covenant, right? When you break the law, what are you considered? A criminal, right? Or unlawful. You've done an unlawful thing. They're saying we are not illegitimate children. Jesus is saying, you have sinned. You have sinned against God. You have broken your covenant against God. Your sin is telling you, you are unlawful. You are in the wrong. You are a criminal. You are corrupt. You are dishonorable to God's name, to Abraham's name, to my name. Right? We are dishonoring our nation when we break its laws and regulations we are dishonoring our our uh, our spouses when we break our vows to them we have vowed to them and looked them in the face and we said I do and will do all these things that I promise you right here and we're breaking that and we're breaking a covenant. We swore before God and we swore before others that we will do this. And we are lying. That makes us a liar. Do you relish blame on your family members for being born for who you are? In other words, like they were doing. They were trying to drag Abraham into their pity party and say, whatever. I don't do that. I am Abraham's children. Abraham, God, in this case, who raised Abraham who is Jesus, is saying, no, you're not doing what Abraham is doing, because Abraham didn't do that. You are dishonoring the covenant I had with Abraham. Are you okay with not knowing something? Are you aware that what you were taught is what you believe and how you behave? They're not doing what Abraham taught them, they're not doing what God taught them. They're not doing what Jesus is trying to teach them. They're doing what someone else has taught them. Who taught these people? Who taught them? Who taught you? Who taught me? Who's teaching you? Who's teaching me? That's what you will do. Jesus says you are doing what you have heard from your father. You are lending your ears to these other teachers who are teaching you something different than what Jesus or what God wants to teach you. And, and Jesus has said, I basically, I'm come from God and I'm trying to teach you something about God. But you keep rejecting what I'm trying to teach you in order to listen to these all false teachers. Do you do that? Are you listening to false teachers? How do you know that you're not listening to the real teachings of God? There are many false teachers in the world. Many, 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 many. They try to Put their own interpretation in the Word of God. Right here. Are you drawn to those teachers? You better check yourself, man. If it's contradictory, if they're just only taking one verse out of the Bible and saying, look, that's my point. You know, that's, that's terrible. That's terrible. You need more than one witness. You need the whole counsel of God right here. Read that whole paragraph. Read that whole context of what it's, the chapter is saying, the whole book is saying. It's not talking about, oh, you being blessed and you doing this and that. That's a that's straight Satan. I know it. I know it. <laughs> I hope you know it. Holy Spirit testify, man. 
I'm telling you, man, they have false teachers everywhere. And I used to do that. I used to preach my emotions. I used to preach my feelings, preach my opinion, preach all. Oh, look what's going on out here. Like, Let's put it in here. Well, you don't need to do that. It's already in here. You just draw it out. <laughs> you got to dig for it, like digging for oil. You got to go in it and just dig and dig until the Holy Spirit speaks to you in it. I read that chapter over and over and over and over and over and over, over, digging it, digging in it, marinating in it, soaking in it over and over and over again until the Holy Spirit speaks. I'm not trying to grab my interpretation or my own life experience or whatever, anything outside and put it in here and try to make it fit in there. You see, we can't depend on our bodies, man. I've caught myself trying to put my own interpretation in here. That's not the truth. Like, again, I apologize for doing that, but that's why I've been taking so long to get right with God. I'm going to get right with the Lord, and I want to teach you what he has to say, not what I want it to say or my feelings. You see, these people love the spotlight too much. You see, a lot of false prophets and teachers and just people, they love the spotlight too much. Just because they're famous does not mean what they're teaching is true. Do you believe you have a you have broken your covenant with God in this case? Have you broken your covenant with the word of God? Are you finding teachers that fit what you want what you want it to say, what you feel, what your emotions or what your dreams or whatever? Have you broken your covenant with God? He said Anyone can whisper in your ear. Anyone can comfort you and say, I love you. That's a good thing, right? Anyone can say, you know, I want the best for you. Anyone can say that. Anyone can say that and, 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 and pretend to say that. But those are two different teachers. Those are two different fathers. Those are two different gods. God will say to me, Jeremy, I love you. I want you. You mean a lot to me. It won't just stop there. He'll say, but you need to repent of your sin. But God, I'm right. But God this, but God. Jeremy, you're wrong. You've sinned against me. You've broken my covenant. And because I love you, I want you to repent. You see, that's a loving father. That's a father, in this case, is what Jesus is exemplifying. That's how much he loves us. That's someone who loves you, someone who tells you the truth. But these other false teachers, they just want you to comfort you and you're a lie. I have an alcohol addiction. That's okay. I don't see you as a drunk. Let me give you that Kanye face. Yeah. And that's what these false teachers do. They just comfort you in your sin and just say, you don't have an alcoholic problem. You don't have these problems in your life. I don't see that. Everything's okay. Everything's good. You don't have to repent of your sin. You don't have to change your behavior. You don't have to do anything. You just have to come to me so I can comfort you. Get away from them because they don't love you. They want to see you. Their sin is tormenting you. Your sin is making you a slave. And the devil wants to just comfort you in your little sin, comfort you and say you ain't got to change. That is not what the Bible teaches. Repent to your sin, turn away from your sin, and move forward towards God. Your sin makes you a criminal in the eyes of God. Your sin makes you a criminal in the eyes of God. And God is calling his church, calling his people, calling me every day. He calls me to repent. I don't like it. 
Just because I'm teaching the word of God and he has anointed me with his grace and his spirit does not mean that he overlooks my sin. He overlooks my sin when I repent of my sin and when I don't go back to my sin. And even if I go back, I got to repent. Your sin cuts you off from the love and peace and goodness of God. And God, I'm getting right now, is calling you to repent. It wasn't my fault. He don't want to hear you justify yourself. He wants to hear your repentance and your sorrow. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let's say, is that hard? Really? I'm sorry. Satan wants to reason. He wants to use you to reason your mind. They're like, don't repent. Don't say I'm sorry. Don't do that because you're right. They see there's no, another way around you to get forgiven. There's another way. You got to just justify yourself enough. You just have to justify the reason enough. There's another way. There's no other way. That's what Jesus is saying. There's no other way. He says the son sets you free. I set you free. No one else can set you free. All right. Repent of your sin. He's calling these people to repent. And right now, I feel like God's calling you to repent of your sin. John 8, 42, 47. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Why don't you understand me? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he's speaking his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. In other words, if this makes perfect sense of what I'm saying to you, you belong to God. God is saying, come, repent of your sins. I want to love you. I want to heal you. I want to give you peace with me. But if you are just, everything I'm saying is just, ah, I just can't stand you. You know, I can't stand it. It hurts. It's a sign that you don't belong to the God. Those who love Jesus love God. But those who do not love Jesus do not love God. There are many people say that I believe in God. Okay, watch out for these people. I believe in God too. So watch out for me. But he, here's the evidence of what he's saying. He's saying, there are not many people who love Jesus. He said, I love God. I know God. Well, what do you think about Jesus? Oh, he's just a teacher. All. I don't really care for him. <laughs> Those who know God, the real true God, they love Jesus. Jesus says that he comes from God. He did not come on his own, but God sent him. These people do not understand who Jesus is or the patterns of his speech. They don't even want to listen to him. They hate listening to him. They can't understand what he means or is saying. They can't even understand the word of God. Jesus testifies of who the devil really is. He says that their devil is their father. They love listening to the devil. Oh, they love listening to him. You don't need to repent of your sin. You're going to be okay. You're not an alcoholic. Your, your life's okay. Yeah, I'm just going to comfort you in that sin instead of call it out and say, look at that, man. Like, I love you, man, but it's that part of your life right there that is really causing you to be a, you know what I mean? Like, you need to change, dude. You need to change whatever your situation is. I love you, and those who love you will correct you. Let me say that again. Those who love you will correct you. They have the same desires as the devil. It's a big claim, Jesus. So the children of the devil listen to their father, who is the devil, 
have the same desires as their father, who is the devil. Do you desire what God desires for you? Or do you desire what Satan desires for you? Jesus claims to have saw the devil in the beginning. He's like, I've always seen the devil. I've watched him like I watched a kitty cat. I'm not saying they're the same, but follow me here. And all you want to do is lie and kill and murder and scratch people. All you want to do is hurt people, devil. I'm not talking about the cat. But that's what Jesus is saying here. Jesus claims to have saw the devil in the beginning. He says that the devil is always a murderer. He's always trying to murder. He's always lying. He can never tell the truth. There is no truth in the devil. And his children do the exact same thing he does. They love to lie. There's no truth in them. They love to murder and hurt people. The devil is their father and the father of lies. But Jesus says about himself, I am the truth. No one can prove that I have ever sinned, Jesus is saying. That's what they're trying to do in this moment. They're trying to find some sort of fault in Jesus' teachings. They're trying to find that I've, I've seen him sin. See, look at, look, at, look at the law. Look at Jesus. Look at We're children of Abraham. And Jesus is like, you can't catch me because I'm not a sinner. I don't sin. But I see your sin. Why don't you believe in me? People who belong to God listen to Jesus. Jesus is saying to them, whoever your teacher is, he is your father. Whoever your teacher is, he is your father. If you listen to a bad teacher, you will become a bad person. If you listen to a good teacher, you will become a good person. If you listen to a false prophet, you become a false prophet. But if you listen to a real prophet, you will become a good prophet. For there are only two teachers in the world. God and his people and his children and Satan and his people and his children. Those who love God love his teachings. They love the Bible. They love the truth. They love it. And those who don't love God do not love the Bible. They do not love the truth. And they do not love Jesus. And people who don't understand the Bible do not understand God, nor do they understand Jesus, who is the truth. They're not of God. I don't understand the Bible. I don't. Well, that's a sign. Can they understand it? Absolutely. But are they willing to? Note when we go further up where we were just talking about, we're back. And he says, if you hold to my teachings, if, it's a condition, it's a stipulation, it's a choice on our behalf. If you hold to my teachings, then you are my disciples. You are my students. You are my pupil. You are my followers. You are my believers. You are my children. A father represents our teachers and what we've learned. Did you know hating a person in your heart is murder? You're like, I've never murdered people. You keep talking about murder. I've never murdered anyone. Jesus is saying, if you hate someone in your heart, you are a murderer. You murder them. Do you repent of that sin? Do you repent of any other sin that Jesus is saying? Or do you find an excuse for everything? Are you a bad listener? I am. I'm guilty. Repent. Both of us. All of us. How often do you lie? Why? Why? Because I'm scared because of this. Okay? Repent. Don't do it again. Where is 
the sin in your life? Are you willing to repent and turn of it? Are you willing to turn away from your sin? Are you willing to walk away from it? If you have a problem with alcohol, are you willing to say, I'm done? You may mess up a few times, but really work on it and try to stay away from it and not go back to it. That's repentance. Repentance is to say, I'm sorry, and then going and popping a booze and getting drunk again. There's nothing wrong with alcohol. There's something wrong with getting drunk or depending on it every day, which is idolatry. Do you constantly think the worst about people or things? Or are you the child of the devil? Or are you the child of God? <sighs> repent. If you're always thinking bad about people, you need to repent. <laughs> Do you yield your mind and body to Jesus' teachings? Or do you love reading the Bible or listening to the Word? Do you yield your body and your mind to this? Do you apply what the Bible says in your life? Do you do what the Bible says or do you just read it? There's no point in reading it if you're not going to apply it. Like James says, it's like looking in the mirror. And walking away and forgetting what you look like. This is the perfect mirror. The perfect image of God is his holy word, the Bible. There is no other Bible. There's only one. It's a closed canon. God is not writing any more scripture. Not sending any more prophets. It's all right here. And do you apply what you believe? Or do you just apply what you believe in front of others? I only believe when someone's watching me. <laughs> I don't believe when I'm in quiet, and it's by myself, and there's the internet, and no one's watching, and I can do whatever I want to do, or my thoughts, I can let it wander and marinate and about whoever I want. Well, those who believe don't obey the word just because someone's watching we obey because of our integrity to know who's really watching us in heaven those are the true believers that's what it means to apply the word of god i'm doing this because i know that god sees me that's who i want to please i want to please god so i'm doing this whether someone's watching me or not because God sees me. You see, people only want to be Christians to be glorified in front of other people. And they only apply the Bible in their life when someone's watching them. They're not trying to please God. They're trying to please people. Are you doing that in your life? Do what the Bible says because you want God to to affirm you. You want God to accept you. You want God to say, I am well pleased. Trust me, if you've never heard those words from God, there's no point in living for anyone else's approval. <sighs> those are the most amazing words that you could ever hear. You were created to hear those words. He created you to say, I'm well pleased with you. And everyone who does not belong to the Lord, the Lord rejects. And the Lord is saying, I am not well pleased with you. You have broken my covenant. You have broken my laws. You have broken your faith. Do whatever it takes to please God. Whoever your teacher is, that is your father. That's what Jesus is saying overall. What you do, or what you allow to govern your mind and your life is who you worship and what you believe. Do you allow the word of God to govern your mind or do you allow entertainment, your emotions, your feelings, your sin, other people, whatever, everything else to govern your mind this should 
take precedence over our minds and our lives. A father is just as equally important as a mother when it comes to raising kids. Children look to their fathers to provide physically and emotional security. All children desire to make their fathers proud, seek their approval or acceptance. Studies have shown that when a father is affectionate and supporting to their children, it highly affects the child's cognitive and social development. A father sets the standard for what relationships with others looks like. The way fathers treat their children directly influences what their children will look for in other people. The child's friends, occupation, and spouse will also be chosen based on what a child's relationship with their father is like. Daughters, young women, depend on their fathers for security and emotional support. And a father shows his daughter what a good relationship is like. If a father is loving and gentle, his daughter will look for those qualities in men when she is old enough. However, if a father is mean and violent, selfish and crude, she will relate closely to men of the same character. Sons, although unlike girls who model their relationships with others based on their father's character, boys will model themselves directly after their father's character. Boys will seek approval from their fathers at a very young age. We, as human beings, are directly influenced by the behavior of those around us. That's how we learn to function in the world. Whether good, bad, or indifferent. If the father is caring and treats other people with respect, the young boy will grow up as much the same. However, When a father is absent, young boys will look to other male figures to set the rules for how to behave and survive in the world. There's a lot going on in the world right now, and there's a lot of bad fathers out there, and there's a lot of bad father figures out there. But that's why we look to the one true father that helps us. Whatever we have learned about our father or what a father should be like, act like or talk like, let me assure you, you are already imitating him right now. It does not matter if you are a woman or a man. Whatever we believe is acceptable as a father, we will imitate that behavior or belief. Consciously or unconsciously on a regular basis. I'm going to give you a glimmer of hope unless we are taught differently. Unless we are taught differently. It's a choice. The father who governs your mind is the father who governs your life. father who governs your mind is the father who governs your life. Let's pray. A father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for yours is the power and the glory and the kingdom forever and ever in jesus name amen